Welcome back to Black News Tonight. It's one of the largest movements in living memory and known by two simple but powerful words, Me Too. However, Me Too movement founder and sexual assault survivor Tarada Burke didn't always have the courage to speak out about her pain. Until now, the story of how she fought to reunite her own fractured soul after her assault and how she rose into organizing with others to bring healing to our community and the world around her is now detailed in a breathtaking new memoir. It's called Unbound, My Story of Liberation and the Birth of the Me Too Movement. It is available now everywhere books are sold, but especially UncleBobby's.com. Here to tell us all about it and much more is the inspiring author and activist herself, Tarana Burke. Tarana, good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, how are you doing? I am, I, first of all, as your friend, and as someone who's known you a very long time, I can't tell you how proud I am of you, how proud I am of this book. Uh, you know, I, I, I picked it up as soon as it came to my store and read it. And it's like, even though you know what's in it, it's still different to read it on the page and to see it out in the world. So I, I just got to tell you how, how much I'm proud of you for seeing this. Uh, and people have been comparing this book, by the way, to I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. They comparing it to the color purple. And usually when people say stuff like that, it don't be true. But this book is <laughs> all of those things, man. How, how does it feel to even be in that conversation? I don't like to have that conversation. Like, those are the holy grails, right? I um, I just wanted to be honest. And, and I wanted to tell my story. And I wanted to make sure I connected, first and foremost, to other Black girls. Um, and black women like myself, and that's probably where the comparison comes from. And it, it feels amazing, but I, you know, that's not where I, <laughs> I stay away from those things. Yeah, yeah. Let let us talk that that ish for you, but 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 it is it is <laughs> that, and it is beautiful, and and it's because it's honest and it's raw and it's true. Um, and one of the places you start and take one of the things you take up in the book. Uh, is your own uh, experience with sexual violence. You talk about sexual assault as a child. You talked about what it means to blame yourself uh, for violence that happens against you. Uh, is that a common experience that, that survivors have? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think more common than not, um, most people who survive sexual violence feel like they are complicit, especially children. Right. We are we raise most of our children, giving them particularly black children or children of color. Uh, we raise them with rules about how they're supposed to behave and how they're supposed to protect themselves and their bodies. Right. You're not supposed to let anybody touch your private parts. You're not supposed to dress a particular way. Um, you're supposed to behave a particular way in front of men or company or what have you. And so when that is violated or when you're violated, it feels like you've just broken a rule. So you bear the shame of that. And, and I think the way you talk about it afterwards, saying that your soul is, is split in two, this idea that there's this side of you that's this brilliant, wonderful sister from the BX who's reading black literature and preaching black power. And then there's this piece of you that, that's carrying the weight of trauma, the pain of, of violence. Um, how do you reconcile those two sides? How do you start to reconcile those two sides? Well, first of all, I think that's the reality of how most survivors live. I think that we have this idea that people who survive sexual violence are kind of walking around in a daze or dragging their knuckles or are always depressed. Most of us are split in two, or at least two, right? We have to we have to live our lives. We have to show up in the world and work and learn and and we also laugh and play and what have you. And then there's this other side. For me, I thought those one side was fake and one side was real. And so how I started reconciling those is when I when I understood that all of those were a part of me and that I wasn't the sum total of the things that happened to me. Like this thing happened to me, but it wasn't who I was. And so this other side that I was calling a side was just a thing that happened to me and wasn't who I was. And as I started to come to that understanding with a lot of help and a lot of support from people um, in the community that I found of other survivors, I, I was able to reconcile and, and, and kind of bring those pieces of myself together. How many, um, or rather how much uh, of you felt 
reluctant to share that story? I mean, was there a party that said, you know what, I, I can tell this story, I can give a genealogy of the Me Too movement, I can talk about what's happening in the world, I can talk about growing up in New York, I can do all this stuff without sharing this particular thing. Did you wrestle with that? I mean, maybe a little bit, but there's no way to, to tell my story or even really the story of this movement without really telling my story. Because if I wasn't a survivor, I wouldn't have been led to want to work with and, and deal with other survivors. And so I had to I had to describe what I was surviving and what it made me feel like so that people could really understand just how strong that feeling was to say, I don't want any other child. I don't want any other little girl. I don't want any other little boy, any other person to carry the weight of what I carry. I don't want to see that in my community. You had to know just how bad it was and just how deeply rooted it is in our community in order for you to understand where the movement grew from. Do you think that gets lost uh, for people? You know, at some point when you become uh, celebrated publicly around the world, that people forget that this is rooted in a real grassroots commitment to, to leaving the world better than you found it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. People are so um, committed to watching this like a tennis match, right? People are just keep, keeping score. You know, there's when the Governor Cuomo steps down, it's one point for, you know, t for um, the Me Too movement. And then Cosby gets let out of jail. Oh, the Me Too movement lost the point, right? And so it's just like a spectator sport as opposed to thinking about the millions and millions of people who are looking and finding community because they need healing, because they want to move forth and have whole lives, or the, the millions and millions of people who want to make sure that we put an end to sexual violence. And that has to happen community by community. There's a, there's a larger movement, but there's also a everyday smaller movement that has to happen in communities, in neighborhoods, in schools. And that's really where our movement started. And we, I want people to get back to that and understand the origin so they understand how important, it is for, how important it is for us to stay rooted in that. Staying rooted in that is what you've always done and it's what this book encourages us to do as well. Um, I want you to hang tight. We're gonna take a break and come back and talk to, talk to you a little bit more about what it means to be a founder of a movement. Uh, everybody stay here. We got much more with Tarana Burke, founder of the Me Too movement, when we come right back. Welcome back to Black News Tonight. Before the break, Me Too movement founder Tarana Burke and I spoke about her brand new memoir. It's called Unbound, and it's available everywhere that books are sold, but especially independent and black bookstores. To continue that conversation and to talk more about her lifetime and activism, uh, we're going to talk about what's next. <laughs> See, I'm she'll here. ever stop working. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so, Tarana, let me ask you a question. When the book starts, you tell this really interesting story about how you were almost like woken out of, I guess, Sunday morning sleep, um, finding out that the Me Too hashtag had been um, going all over the internet. And there was this initial moment that I remember very vividly when the word and the phrase Me Too was not being attributed to you. Now, a whole bunch of people uh, were 10 toes down to make sure that that got corrected. But talk a little <laughs> bit about what it meant to see a project that you worked on for so long as a, as a, at a genuine love almost be co-opted and taken away and why that mattered. Oh, it was scary. It was a very scary. That's what I describe in the book. It was scary because the reality is we and by we, I mean Black people, understand what it means to have our work um, be taken and used by other people and not accredited to us. We know what it means. I was just thinking, this world is not going to believe that a 44-year-old Black woman from the Bronx has been doing this work for a decade, right? And I thought, they're not going to, um, this is going to become about, this is essentially what happened to some degree. But I'll tell you what else happened. I realized very quickly that this was also about my, my assignment, right? This didn't mean that, that I wasn't a part of what was happening. This was, also an ex this was also an expansion of my assignment, right? I knew that this was my work and what was happening with Me Too went viral was also my work. And it just was a matter of me raising my voice. So my fears dissipated. You know, people still talk about how the white people took your movement over and the white people took your movement from you. If you think what you see on television 
hashtag me too is my movement, then you can't call me the leader of the me too movement because hashtag me too is not a movement. The Me Too movement is the work that we do every single day with Me Too International. It's the work that's happening in communities all across the United States, all across the world. It is not what's going on in Hollywood. It's not these court cases. It's not these high profile people. It is way, way bigger than that. And that's the work that I've been committed to and remain committed to. Whenever I tweet you or tweet about Me Too or tweet anything that's you know, anti-rape, which apparently is a radical position in some circles. People say that you are part of, you know, this movement to destroy men, or sometimes they say to destroy black men. They say that Tarana Burke is, is an enemy to black people and black men. When you hear stuff like that, I know there's a political answer and I want to hear that, but there has to also be a personal answer to that. How do you feel when you're framed that way? The personal answer is this, it's the most heartbreaking thing that I've experienced in the last four years. And you know me, right? <laughs> like, you know, know me. I, I consider you a brother. And hear people say me, I'm the blackest person people know. I've spent my life committed <laughs> to black people. Literally. Right? And, 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 and everything, I bleed red, black, and green. You think I would do anything that would jeopardize my community? But at the same time, if there are people in the community that are trying to harm others in the community, they should be accountable for that. So yes, I want to say, if there are Black men in the community or Black women in the community, anybody in the community that, is, that wants to harm other people, we have to call that out. Accountability, to me, is another form of love. And if we really love our people, then we have to be willing to hold them accountable when they harm us. I'm not going to die on the hill of just black just for the sake of being black, because every brother ain't a brother. And if you think that I'm not going to call out an R. Kelly, who is a serial predator in our community, because he's black, that's a problem. Because who will speak for the black women? Who will speak for the black children? I love black people. I love black people, full stop. I love black men, full stop. And because I love black men and because I love black people, I'm okay with holding us accountable. But it's painful for people to, to say I'm an enemy to black men, absolutely not. When you hear the phrase me too used as a verb, I've heard people say so-and-so got me too or so-and-so is afraid they are gonna get <laughs> me too That's the language that people use. Help us understand, help the audience understand why that's problematic. First of all, it's deeply offensive because Me Too, as a, as a phrase, is it about an exchange of empathy. It's a declaration of a person who has survived from things that you can possibly survive. And I am saying to the world, or I'm saying to another person, I understand. I see you, Right. That happened to you, I, I know what that feels like because it happened to me too. So when you reduce it and say, oh, I wonder who the next person is that's gonna get me too, that takes that away, that, that bit of power away from the survivor and assigns it to a person who causes harm or who may have caused harm. And it really undermines the work that we're trying to do in the movement to shine a light on survivors, not on people who cause harm. So I just wish people would stop using it in that way. It's not a verb. It is a declaration. You, earlier this spring, released another bestseller. Uh, I should say a bestseller. Technically, your new book isn't a bestseller yet. We got to wait <laughs> about four, five more days to prove that. But I'm naming and claiming that already. That's going to be a bestseller. But you wrote a, you co-edited a book. <laughs> you co-edited a book called You Are Your Best Thing. You are invited to events. You are on television. You are on the cover of magazines. How, how much of this was foreseeable to you? How much of this was unforeseeable to you, say, five years ago? No, it was all unforeseeable five years ago. <laughs> None of this was in my future. It wasn't even a vision for myself except for the work of Me Too. Um, and even that, I think the trajectory for the Me Too movement was quite different. Um, I, I never thought that we could have a national or international dialogue around sexual violence. I never thought that I could, could move this topic as far as uh, we've moved it in the mainstream. So none of this felt like it was possible for, for movement work. And then personally, I mean, I've always wanted to be an author. I've always fancied myself a writer. But it's so difficult to break into writing, even when you have as many writer friends as I do. 
Um, so I, I didn't see any of this as my immediate future. But what the last four years have shown me is that, you know, we don't control any of this, but we certainly should dream big. And I just I just didn't dream big enough for myself. I thought I should just dream with limits that with, with, were within reason um, and, you know, manage my expectations. But I don't feel that way anymore. Well, sometimes I say God can dream dreams for you bigger than you can dream for yourself. And, and that's certainly uh, what happened with you. And, and I think, quite frankly, the reason is because you did it from a place of love. You did it from a place of genuine care for our people. You didn't do it to be all in the videos. You didn't do it to hit the red carpet. You didn't do it to get a magazine cover or to make a bunch of money. You did it because you loved black people and you wanted the most vulnerable among us to be healed and to be free. And, and that's why you're, you're so successful. That's why we love you. That's why I love you. And that's why I'm so proud of you. And I'm so proud of this book. Uh, everybody, I want y'all to go out there and get this book. Matter of fact, and I don't usually do it, I want y'all to go out there and buy two of them. And if you know somebody that is in need of a book like this, go buy them one too. This is a book, this ain't about making money, this ain't got nothing to do with money. This is about advancing a conversation that we have to have in this country about sexual assault, about sexual violence, about healing the vulnerable, about moving us into a new space. What Tarana Burke has done with this book is open up her own wounds, is open up and expose her own pain. And like, uh, like the Greek character, Chiron, the wounded healer, she has been willing to expose her wounds while being a healer for others. She is the consummate wounded healer. And as a wounded healer, she's going about the world of building a movement while repairing herself. And she exposes every bit of that in this wonderful, beautiful, righteous book. It is one of the great memoirs you're gonna read of this generation. It is one of the most beautiful tomes that you're gonna read of any generation. But it also marks a moment in our history where a black woman writer, a black woman thinker, a black woman organizer who's been organizing since she was 14, a black woman activist that speaks out against every type of injustice in this world, where she has marshaled her power, her courage. She's transformed her pain into power, and she has made an entire movement cry for justice. This is a special book. This is a special moment. This is a special movement, and we all need to be a part of it. So make sure you check out this book. It's called Unbound. Everybody, I'm wishing you a night of peace, a night of love, and a night of justice. Stay with us here at Black News Channel. We got Yodi Tuolde up next with Making the Case. And after that, we got Charles Blow with Prime.